Greetings, this is Eugene the Philosopher, the greatest living philosopher after the unfortunate passing of Quentin Robert de Nameland, who has been the greatest living philosopher before me. In this video, if it wasn't yet clear enough from the thumbnail, we'll talk about China. And in particular, there was an issue, like apparent in the recent few weeks, um, at least from my news feed on Facebook, so it's a little bit of a biased uh, sample. But still, the problem was apparent that many people are concerned with China, like China's role in the current events, China's potential role in the following events, I mean, potentially following from now, etc., etc. And this video is a sort of... Um, uh, I was planning to make it like a, as a response video, you know, in old traditions of YouTube, so to speak. So it would be my take on the role of China, and in particular... Uh, the general idea of this video is that China is overrated, you shouldn't be afraid of China, and perhaps, um, like, there are some people who want you to be afraid of China that you should rather be afraid of, right? Or something like that. Or at least you should be concerned with some other people that want to make you be afraid of China, or whatever. Anyways, that, that way, in this way or another, as one uh, listener noted once, uh, main point of this video is that China is overrated, and you shouldn't be afraid of China. Alright, and let's consider some of the pieces of evidence that I shall propose to you in this respect. In particular, like we may look at the history, and just like purely numerically estimate the thickness of, of China, so to speak, uh, in historical sense. And my point here would be that the China, China is actually way too young to compete with um, the world's major powers, all right? So, it of course is may, may be concerned, uh, considered as a somewhat of a weaker point, like it's not necessary necessary that the younger states uh, are weaker states, but still, it's a point to consider, okay? So, People's Republic of China basically appeared in 1949, all right? So, it's, it's a relatively young state. It's only like 70 or how long? Um, yeah, about 70 years old, right? 73 or 72, something like that. Um, so it did, did not really have that much time to develop its own like patterns of cultural operation in the world, if you know what I mean, like its own tradition, its own even like diplomatic traditions to have like various loopholes uh, into the world's elites, etc., etc. So all these pragmatic things actually v matter very much, and even more so. Of course, I have much stronger points with respect to that, like in particular. I think that China is under external control, like it's not even a separate state, like a completely autonomous entity, right? Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. But some people may have a counter-argument, like China has all these supposedly thousands of years of history, right? Even before, like the modern People's Republic of China, to which I would respond that, well, it, China's history is, at the very least, not longer than Europe's known history. And by known history, I mean the last 400 years, really. Uh, I mean, the observable uh, time span of history since roughly the year 1600. Uh, all right? Uh, because before that, like, history becomes kind of like a fairy tale. And if we're talking about China or Japan, then... Already in 18th century, history is more like a fairy tale than reality, to be honest. Uh, so people uh, often talk about all these, I don't know, uh, duchies or kingdoms of China of like 6th century. And they cannot even, at the same time, they cannot even list the rulers of China of 19th century, which is much closer to us and should be much better known and much more observable, right? So it brings forth some difficult questions that more, most likely all of this is made up, right? All of this uh, that we supposedly know about the very ancient past. Uh, but even in the known history, what we can observe is that China was o always almost like an under-external occupation, right? Was the Manchu, I'm not sure if it's the proper English uh, term actually, like Ma Manchuko, 
Manchuria, uh, Manchu um, occupation, basically, right? So it was an external rule over China, which actually allowed China to exist as a quasi uh, single entity. Because in reality, uh, again, in all of the observable history in the last 200 years, let's say 300 years at best, um, uh, China was really a confederacy, right, or um, confederation, if you like, uh, of of uh, separate states, right, separate provinces. Uh, some of them even had their own languages. Again, China didn't have a single language until very recently, and well, to some degree, doesn't have a language even to this day, right. Um, so China was always this weird assembly of of different provinces. Again, held together only through this external rule of, of Manchu dynasty, right? Because, again, all these various states, they kind of hated each other and they could not uh, agree on the rule of any one of them over others. Uh, so this very brittle balance of power between those states was only like equalized by a completely external force above them, right? So this nomadic like Mongol slash Tatari slash whatever rule of Manchu uh, over the Chinese. And in this way, they were able to settle, that, settle their conflicts, right? So this is how it works, even though, again, even the power of the emperor was basically cer ceremonial. It was theatrical, like nobody cared about emperor, right? So China did not really exist as a separate state, even to the end of the 19th century, right? Uh, when they had a war with Japan, for example, in 1895, it wasn't really a war of, of like single army of China versus single army of Japan. It was actually a war of a few Chinese states versus the army of Japan, you know. They didn't even have a single taxation system. Basically, their taxation was provincial kings or however you wish to call them, lords, uh, bring it, were bringing their money, like the abs absolutely arbitrary amount of money, uh, the one they w wished to bring to the capital, right? So they didn't even have an, a necessary obligation to bring anything, anything significant at the very least. So it was all very theatrical and ceremonial, right? So in some sense, China did not exist in, in some very deep sense. Uh, again, it only existed in this sort of play-like manner, okay? So yeah, that pretty much summarizes my point that Chinese history is only very recent. Like China is a very young, very ambitious state. And you can see it, I mean, they, they're very, very, they're, their very rapid development is actually an evidence for, uh, for it to be a very young nation, a very young state. Again, it only appeared 70 years ago. Uh, and they've done a lot in these 70 years, I mean, uh, I'll give you that, but uh, it cannot coexist with the notion that they are thousands of years old as a nation. It's just mutually exclusive, right? Rapid growth like that and thousands of years of history. It's impossible, uh, but somehow people settle for that, uh, I mean, uh, like in modern cultural discourse, and, and they kind of attribute this to like Chinese unknown character, unknown mysterious Chinese soul or anything. Whether, whereas in reality, in my opinion, it should be attributed to a completely fictitious character of Chinese history before 20th century. And even in the first half of 20th century. Uh, like basically anything after the Chinese revolution of 1911. And actually a lot of events before that revolution, um, basically a whole century before that. When Ger Europeans were preparing China for uh, occupation, essentially, um, like major European and world powers in general, I mean, European plus Japan and the US, basically, they were preparing China for occupation. And thus, like a lot of events are se severely misrepresented, a lot of recent events of Chinese history and the whole war, like civil war, revolution, etc., is even more so misrepresented. It's just like a complete fog of war from 1911 to 1949. Like just, you just cannot distinguish anything there. Everything is so fairy tale ish. Like it, it just completely make, makes absolutely no sense what, what's going on in there. 
Um, but again, basically what was going on is in the year 1911, Europeans started um, the division of China. And what we got uh, by the year 1949 is that Britain is now controlling China pretty much. Um, and that's it. And the world had to go through, of course, uh, two world wars in, in the middle of that process. Uh, but eventually, and again, as I've stated in one of uh, other video, maybe ongoing virtual war, um, that this was the real prize of World War II, right? The, co the colonial co control over China. Okay, so yeah, this is the second point I wanted to bring, is the external control over China, that basically, uh, you may agree with, the, with this or not, but uh, I would ag argue that uh, China is the British colony, essentially, again, since 1949, uh, uh, which is also, conveniently enough, roughly the time of the Cold War, right? So when the... Uh, basically what happened after the World War II is that uh, the British w managed to sneak uh, China from the US, right? and also USSR was still uh, the British colony and uh, the British uh, proposed Americans to rule the world together right the Fulton speech of Churchill in 1947 etc but the Americans refused they wanted to stay at the uh, to be the, the the world's first superpower right uh, the world's hegemon essentially uh, whereas Britain was before the world war it was uh, the world's hegemon right but then the the status shifted after the world war ii and, and the u.s became the hegemon and the britain became the sub hegemon like the second uh, largest uh, superpower uh yeah and that started the cold war essentially right it's as ultimately the sort of the tug of war between Britain and the US. This is what we call the Cold War, i.e. the British nuclear platform that we know as the USSR versus uh, uh, the United States. And now we kind of have the same thing with China, right? The USSR is no longer there. There's only like a pale shadow of it called Russia. Uh, but we also have China, another British uh, tool uh, of the same sort. Um, so it's completely possible. Okay, I'll, I'll return to this issue later. But anyway, uh, my point here is that in this second point that uh, China is under external control is that China's policy cannot even be considered uh, without uh, looking at this larger Anglo-American context, right? Uh, and again, I reference my video ongoing virtual war uh, in this regard. Okay, uh, another point I wanted to make here uh, to kind of reinforce my main argument is that Chinese army is purely for internal use. Uh, like if, if you look at history of how it has been used so far, it was at the very best like border skirmishes uh, or like, like border disputes and like maybe some occasional fights at some islands like with Vietnamese or whatever um, uh, but in general uh, Chinese army has not been involved I, I mean some peacekeeping operations but it, it's really nothing uh, but uh, other than that Chinese army was not used was never used in any major conflict right uh, whereas the USSR's army was actually used so it's, a, it's already a big difference uh, so, yeah, uh, I mean, think about the invasion of Af Afghanistan, etc. We've, we've seen nothing like that from Chinese army, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, in the, even in this sense, China is a much more, uh, f much more of a pale threat uh, with respect to the USSR, for example, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, that this title, People's um, Liberation Army, right? Uh, the official name of the Chinese army. But, I mean, you know that in case of, like, whatever statists or socialists say, you need to kind of reverse it, right? So, re the real name of Chinese army 
should be people's enslavement army, right? So its purpose is exactly that, to enslave the Chinese people, to uh, reinforce the current uh, rule of the rule of the current Chinese government to make sure that nobody revolts against it, right? And this is the primary purpose and perhaps the only purpose of the Chinese army today. So yeah, um, again, this is an argument against China being a threat, uh, any sort of like a global threat of security or something. Okay, another. Uh, evidence is from the realm of culture, I would say, and it's uh, Chinese non-warlike nature, I would say. Uh, again, you might quote perhaps like some vague 6th century wars, uh, the mythic wars that China supposedly have had, but in observable history, like all the wars China have had were well, let's say, by European standards, not really good wars, you know, in, in, in like normal wars, so to speak, that European states have had in, in between themselves. And like culturally, Chinese are not very like warmongering type of people, right? They're really perhaps the best at like short lucky skirmishes, something like that, right? They, they cannot really... Uh, focus on the war and then, like commit to a war and be like very strategic and, and uh, confident in it right they they have this boldness about them sure like they they can pursue a, uh, an aim with with like a high degree of commitment but at the same time at the first sign of, of um, trouble they often like completely crumble right and and just like completely lose lose uh, their s so to speak uh, so yeah so their their nature i guess again i'm kind of repeating myself but chinese don't really have a warlike nature that's what i'm saying uh that's one thing and another thing from the same cultural realm is their sort of like a self-centered centered nature right self-centered culture uh, where they, they were they were always kind of in their own um, how do you call it like boiling pot right uh, and they're they're kind of poor at understanding others for for this reason so uh, in, in a very stark contrast to the British people for example who always know w which strings to pull to like make these other people do what the British want them to do, right? So Chinese don't even understand other people f frequently. Like they, they, again, the culture is so alien, right, to everything else on this planet, <laughs> pretty much. Like Europeans at the very least, right? It's, it's, it's a different civilization, yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of pre, it's kind of hard to export, uh, Chinese cultural codes to other places. Like we've already had the world pre-prepared by the British Empire for any other like Western influences, right? So these more or less pass on pretty well uh, because the world is prepared for them. But China is a completely foreign influence with respect to, to these. So it's kind of it's kind of hard, right, for, for China to expand anywhere. Again, China doesn't even want to expand anywhere, really. I mean, it's just not in their character. Okay. Um, in this respect, China is kind of like Germany. Like, Germany actually had colonies, including in China, but it was always kind of uh, iffy, kind of rough for them. Uh, it didn't really work out that well. Um, so I guess if China would try to, like subdue someone like to colonize someone it would be look kind of like germany uh, it wouldn't really work uh, that's what i'm saying so yeah self-centered culture poor at understanding others and it, what is characteristic of this point uh, also uh, and i'll use it to enforce it once again is that uh, there is really no or very little of original content, if you like, in Chinese culture. Like, really, what we can see, or at least the, le the very least, like, what we can uh, perceive the best, we as Europeans, so it may be a little bit biased, is the 
Chinese copies of European stuff, of Western stuff. So uh, Chinese are really good, again, just like Japanese, in copying European stuff and actually in many ways surpassing uh, Europeans in their copied stuff, right? So, but this is again a symptom of just being a copy. They just like, you know, grasp only like the very rough thing and like try to uh, absolutize it, right? So they don't even quite understand what they are copying, right? So that's why they're hyperbolizing it to such a degree, etc., etc. So, yeah. Like, of course, you're, you're gonna quote, again, a thousand mythic inventions from like a, a million years BC when the Chinese invented, I don't know, whatever, like mechanical watches, etc. and, and pow gunpowder and paper. But, well, my question would be, why didn't they do anything with it? I mean, it still means that they're, even if they did invent those things, which I kind of doubt, but even if they did, okay, well, I mean, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. The, f the fact that they did not succeed in turning them into the same things that Europeans have turned them into means that Chinese civilization was not fit, again, for any sort of world dominance, right? Even if you take all this narrative for gra granted, um, the narrative of like our history courses uh, as they are taught today. Okay. So it only reinforces my point uh, in any way. Mm. All right. And in the, perceived in this way, ultimately, uh, the, sec the, the nature of Chinese state, the secondary nature of Chinese state it becomes apparent, right? Um, and, and if you think about like the ancient Chinese culture, it would be most likely again a layer of even older copying of Europeans, kind of like with Japan, you know, when you think about it, like samurai and bushido, etc. These were basically a poorly understood cargo cults of European knightship, you know, European knights, etc. Uh, even though at the time all those things appeared, I mean, samurai, bushido, shogun, etc. Uh, knights didn't didn't really exist in Europe anymore, so it was like a late cargo cult, right? Appeared only in like 17th, 18th century uh, in Japan, etc. Uh, like Japan is, a, is like a Chinese backyard. It's it's actually a, an even even newer culture in many respects, and even more derivative from European uh, than Chinese, like. Most of original things we think are Japanese are actually copied th Chinese things. Right? <laughs> original Chinese, but copied by Japanese. Uh, okay. Uh, so, I don't claim that Chinese don't have any original things. Of course, again, as a different civilization, they have plenty of original things. But uh, what I'm saying is they didn't really have much success in terms of gross power, let's say, in the world thanks to those things. Again, maybe they simply did not want to have this power, but this again reinforces my point, my main point of this video, that China is not a world threat, basically, right? Okay, and even if you think about the Buddhism, for example, like what we know as modern, like Buddhism and maybe even Confucianism to a large degree, is actually was actually introduced to China and Japan from London by like uh, British philologists such as Max Müller, for example. Uh, like for some mysterious reason, uh, Buddhist texts in China were destroyed in like early 20th century, etc., or late 19th century, and all those revolutions, etc., etc. So they had to reintroduce Buddhism into China through students of Max Müller, the British philologist. Uh, so uh, there were a couple of guys with uh, the names of which I wouldn't try to pronounce, who again went to London, studied under Müller, and then went back to China and Japan respectively and printed like m millions of these Buddhist books. Right, so that's how Buddhism reappeared or just appeared in China slash Japan. And again, it was all very recent history, like observable history, last 100 years or so. Okay, um, other set of reasons are economic. 
uh, for China not being the any sort of like a world superpower in any time soon. In particular, there's a huge uh, chunk of demographic reasons. I mean, you've definitely heard about the curious relationships of China with demography, but maybe you didn't hear that uh, they are actually beyond replacement fertility levels since 1992. So for almost 30 years, uh, Chinese women give birth to less people than you know ne are needed to at least replace the existing population. So already more than a generation of people, uh, like there's less people born than is needed to sustain the population. So their population is rapidly growing old and is going to decline very soon, like very rapidly decline. And not only that, um, but like, one problem is just just the decline of the population, right? But the other problem is a whole chunk of like economic problems put on top of this declining population, which perhaps other places on Earth with declining population do not have, uh, or maybe not, at least not to such a degree. I mean, if you look at the pension system, like you know, retirement payments, etc., well, they're basically non-existent in China, right? So. What are you going to do with all these bunch of old people who are going to appear pretty soon? Like, who's going to pay for them, basically? Who's going to, how do you call it, uh, well, provide for them, at the very least, etc., etc. There's simply not enough young people for that. Uh, and to make it all even worse, uh, the whole country is ultimately a huge investment bubble, right? So China is like a world factory already planned like decades in advance, right? So assuming that the world's economy is going to grow infinitely, exponentially, China is okay. But if it's not the case, then they're pretty screwed, you know? Like they've already invested in this economic uh, exponential growth. But if there's no growth, so there's no demand on their whatever they're producing, well, they're going to lose a lot of money and they're going to be poor and... A lot of economic problems are going to appear. Like the bubble's going to burst. Uh, somebody would have to pay for all of that. And again, they don't have enough people for uh, pay for all of that. I mean, enough people to pay for the debts of this amount of people that they've had previously, right? Something like that. Like they've had all these ghost cities, which are used as an investment uh, portfolio, so to speak, part of investment portfolio. But... Uh, if you make an investment, you expect a return. But, I mean, who's going to live in those cities and therefore provide this return if there's no more people being born, you know? Uh, who's going to work to pay for those cities on the next step, next iteration, next generation, right? To, again, return the money invested into those cities. Uh, the answer is no one. There's no such people. They're not being born, right? So this is a real problem. I mean, it's kind of a, like a whole knot of problems. Uh, plus, China has uh, invested tons of money in other places, so it doesn't really want to, you know, go for war with, let's say, United States. I mean, China is the second largest holder of the U.S. bonds, right? After J Japan, it's like more than one trillion dollars. Uh, so it's a lot of money, I mean, right? Uh, okay, so I think, I think I mean, all of those problems are, should be apparent to any sort of uh, reasonable person. But somehow, again, uh, uh, whatever. So some other perhaps curious issues might include, um, well, for example, a very curious issue is that maybe you didn't heard of it, but probably you did, but whatever, I'll tell you anyways, that there is two Chinas, so to speak. There are, uh, and the real China is Taiwan, actually, right? Taiwan is called Republic of China, and Taiwan is actually the founder of the United Nations, not the People's Republic of China, uh, but Republic of China, which is, again, Taiwan. I'm sorry for this circular argumentation here. Uh, so, yeah, so after the World War II, like in 1949, pretty much we've had two Chinas, kind of like two Koreas, uh, right? The British 
China, which is the People's Republic of China, and the American China, which is Republic of China, aka Taiwan. And we had the British Korea in the north and the American Korea in the south. So again, same same thing. As I've already told you, like after the World War II, you have to look at the tug of war between Britain and America, and this is pretty much the model of the world, of the post-war world. Um, and you will understand more or less everything that happens. And you have like the British controlled USSR and American controlled Japan, for example, etc. etc. Uh, okay. So this is pretty much like the model of the post-war world. Uh, and until 70s, uh, actually, the real American China, aka Taiwan, was recognized as the China by most of the countries in the world. Only like, again, in the 70s, when there was like a sort of, some sort of a truce between the US and, and uh, the Britain, uh, a truce in the Cold War, I mean... Uh, the People's Republic of China started being recognized as the China and Taiwan kind of fell fell out of uh, grace, so to speak, right? Well, that's one interesting problem. So, I mean, it's, it's one, let's say, boot. It's one boot in the closing door of Chinese dominance, right? So, whenever there would be a problem, Taiwan card would be reintroduced, like, and people would say, hey, wait a minute, we have real China right here. People's Republic of China is not even in a legitimate state, you know, etc., etc. And that would open such a can of worms that China wouldn't be able to deal with it. Um, well, that's one issue. Another issue is Corona, of course. Like, um, I mean, it has been more or less clear that Corona appeared from the lab again. I wrote about this uh, like a year ago, roughly, but it, it was clear for everyone, more or less. Uh, and again, probably with the help of like British, uh, maybe French, even I don't know uh, researchers. Uh, so I mean, British uh, are are famous for again. Where where are the nuclear weapons tested? Well, pretty much in the British colonies nowadays. So biological weapons, I would assume, are tested in British colonies as well. Even though I'm actually tempted to think, uh, as I did a year ago, that Corona was produced uh, in like a, a genuine m m medical test. So it's it's not it was not intended for like any sort of damaging. Uh, harmful agent. It was actually a genuine re medical research. But anyway, the virus was produced and accidentally released. And so now the question is, well, the world might say, uh, well, China, uh, can you please compensate for all the losses that you've caused by releasing this virus, right? And that would be a lot of money, I would assume. It would be like maybe tens of trillions of dollars. It would be like comparable to the world's GDP, uh, I would assume. At least like maybe tens of percent of the world's GDP. Which, I mean, uh, the loss of which was caused by uh, the, the corona, right? And that's a lot of money. Basically, they would have to sell their whole country to everyone else in the world uh, in order to pay for that. So this is another boot uh, in the closing door of um, Chinese dominance in the world. So yeah, I mean, there's so much, uh, there's so many tools to blackmail them if needed that it's not possible. Like people, I have a feeling that people who paint this horrible picture of Chinese uh, overlords, uh, like controlling everything and everyone, they almost like assume that there's no one else living in the world like there, there, there are no British elites again which are there for at least like 400 years well 300 years at least there are no American elites which are there for at least 200 years there are no like French and German elites which are there for uh, 300 years maybe um, etc etc like China just appeared out of nowhere and in 70 years became culturally, economically, politically the most powerful nation in the world. And 
it did so not even owing to anyone anything, right? I mean, it's such an absurd statement as if like, you know, nothing was connected in the world, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's just really hard to believe that any sort of educated people would make such statements. Uh, okay. So, what can cause these sentiments, I would say? Well, maybe maybe it's some sort of xenophobia. It actually looks like that, you know. Again, xenophobia is the literally the fear of other, right? The fear of unknown other, sort of. Sort of. So, as China is a different civilization... It definitely ca can cause, and probably does cause xenophobia. So people don't understand Chinese. I mean, like Western slash European slash American people don't understand Chinese people, and they are afraid of them. So they start attributing all these malicious things, all these malicious characteristics to Chinese. And um, I, I mean, since we're in this chaos of of the ongoing virtual war, as I've called it in the eponymous video. Well, it's pretty convenient to blame Chinese for everything that we observe around us, right? Uh, so we need some sort of external enemy to focus on, which is also very good for statists or socialists all over the world to retain their power, etc. So uh, instead of you focusing on your stupid American government, you may focus on evil Chinese government, right? And vice versa, by the way. Uh, so both the Chinese and American government are satisfied with this. Uh, and both American and Chinese people are dissatisfied, but not with their governments, which they should be, but with, you know, the other guys' govern governments, right? Uh, okay. And again, it's, it's kind of uh, reminiscent of the Cold War, right? When the Americans had Soviets as this Zeno, which they were phobic of, uh, and now they have China. Uh, so this brings some sort of clarity amongst amidst chaos. Uh, but then again, maybe Americans would be, be better off listening to their own movies, uh, looking at their own movies. Even though arguably Hollywood is like a British colony inside the U.S. Uh, and I'm not even joking. I mean, uh, it is actually, yes. Uh, so, but anyway, <laughs> what does Hollywood show us is that, uh, the evil guy is the British guy, right? So maybe, maybe you should actually listen to what these people are telling you. Um, okay, it was kind of a Bill Burr type of moment, which is, uh, convenient because the title of this video is uh, the same as the title of Bill Burr's special, right? Paper Tiger, which is, if you don't know, it's the phrase, that uh, Chairman Mao, the, the Mr. British agent, used to describe America, right? That they are, like, not a real threat. So it's kind of like a tiger, so it's kind of like a threat, but it's made of paper, so it's just a fictitious threat, right? But I'm using the same expression for China itself, because, yes, it is a fictitious th threat currently for see above how many factors and uh, how many reasons I mean and those aren't even all of the reasons those are only some of the reasons okay um, then some people actually argued some people in again my friends uh, newsfeed on Facebook that um, big tech is controlled by Chinese um, uh, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's not. It's actually controlled by the U.S. intelligence uh, or like U.S. secret services. And I mean, it's very easy to understand why. Like the U.S. is the world's hegemon. I mean, again, well, okay, we'll, we'll return to this issue later. But period, like uh, big tech, like Facebook, Google, etc., uh, etc., et Apple, uh, Amazon, they're controlled by uh, the U.S. intelligence. Why? Well, it's easy to understand. I mean, what is Facebook? Let's think about it. Well, it's basically what it says. It's the book with faces. I mean, the police database, right, of, of people. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing invention where all the secret services that they now have is that people are producing the private file, I mean, the files, you know, the, all these proverbial, like, police files on, on different people or, or, like, reconnaissance 
intelligence files on some person that people produce these files by themselves and providing them into the public domain right for the whatever intelligent um, interested parties to look at so yeah that's facebook that's a police database and by the way the eu is going to launch its own version of, of uh, like its own um, I don't know, like uh, social network, kind of like Facebook, uh, pretty soon, as far as I understand. But that's a different story. Again, we'll talk about EU uh, in a moment. Uh, but like information, again, speaking about Google, Amazon, etc. Uh, information is the main resource of warfare, right? It's the main commodity, you might say. Uh, so why wouldn't Google be controlled by the U.S. intelligence? I mean, there's no reason for it not to be controlled, you know. Um, yeah, and there's no real reason for it to be controlled by China. Like, why would China control it? Why? There's no economic reason. There's no political reason. There's no technical reason. There's no technical possibility, probably, right? Okay, um, I mean, speaking about the location of servers and things like that, like China more or less has its own internet, for uh, as much as I know. So, uh, yeah, there goes that. Yeah, yeah, and speaking about the EU, like the Great Reset, again, a lot of people are concerned with it for some reason. I mean, understandable why, but uh, Corona and stuff, but uh what i've already said in my video ongoing ongoing virtual war is that uh probably we're not going to have any sort of new world order uh in the next uh, decades even half a century probably even a whole century uh i mean we'll have the new order but it wouldn't be like the the globalist any sort of new world order as as it's painted by conspiracy theorists by I should say other conspiracy theorists other than me uh me also being a conspiracy theorist of course uh in this respect at least right so uh, no great reset of this in this sense but we are going to have a great reset in the sense that again we previously had the us as a hegemon and uk as the sub hegemon uk with all its vassals as a sub hegemon uh, but now the EU is stepping in to replace the UK, right? So now we'll have the US as a hegemon and EU as a sub-hegemon. The status of the UK is now very questionable. And this might actually bring a lot of chaos into the world. So all of the British domain might now have some sort of spasms, if you know what I mean, like... Places like Iran, places like, again, China, places like Russia, India, pieces of Africa, Australia, um, Canada. There may be very interesting developments there, right? But, uh, I, like, I feel like the world needs some sort of new thing, you know, to kind of wrap this up. Uh, in some sort of thing, like in the recent couple of decades, what we had, like modernization, innovation, war on terror, uh, and something like that, like those were the main mottos, right, of, of the last two decades. Multiculturalism was another motto. Uh, neoliberalism, some people say, like mostly commies. Uh, but now we will have, again, a couple of mottos like that, under which some new developments would arise. And, well, I mean, there's plenty of intellectual resources in EU available to wrap this in some sort of um, fancy, uh, presentable uh, uh, tissue. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, maybe we'll have some nasty events, like, I don't know, some, uh, some like, state would suddenly crumble and disappear like canada would disappear suddenly or something uh, i mean i've already talked about like quebec potentially entering the eu etc etc i mean the uk would dissolve most likely uh and what would happen to china and india well they'll, they'll probably b become more like autonomous and independent in the first place um but then again it would mean actually more problems than than uh 
more problems would be created through that than would be solved perhaps but i don't know but maybe it would actually bring prosperity because those people would not be no longer be bound by these previous political affiliations and would be able to like let's say trade more openly or something like that like again i've already expressed my hopes that you europe itself like european union would become more open like more free market oriented because they've lived the previous decades under socialism because they were like a third world country i mean there was a hegemon sub hegemon and there was eu somewhere down below but now they wouldn't be down below so they would be able to allow themselves more free market essentially so less socialism because socialism is a military economy during peacetime right and they were under some sort of like austerity, military type austerity. So they had to be socialist for some time at least. And now they don't. So who knows? I'm pretty optimistic with regards to that. I'm actually a very like Europocentric person. So I'm very optimistic with regards to the coming European rule uh, in this part of the world where I am at the very least. Right. Uh, okay. So this is my picture of the Great Reset. Uh, it wasn't invented by me, by the way. I'm mostly like I'm quoting other people's here. Um, yeah. So nothing scary is really happening. But in, in case you needed some clarity, <laughs> there's some stupid fly here. So in case you needed some clarity, hopefully you got it from, from this uh, abstract picture that I gave to you. Uh, so in case you're concerned with the like the Corona measures, etc., etc., well, you have to understand that we are at war. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not a very difficult or scary war, right? Uh, no one is really dying. I mean, some people are dying, but it's not even nearly comparable to the previous war so just keep calm uh, you know as this famous meme states uh, keep calm carry on like in, in maybe a year the war would be over uh, the queen would die so people would start like again resuming into this new world order right under eu uh, so again some serious shifts uh, on the um, fringes of the British Empire would follow, but uh, other than that, I mean, things things would proceed as previously. So you shouldn't be afraid of China. That's basically the point of this video, right? The China is not any sort of threat in this paradigm, at the very least. Okay, right. So to conclude this round, there's plenty of reasons why China is not the world's threat it's not in a position to threaten the world it doesn't even want to threaten the world blah 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 and i just listed them those are like historical reasons china is very young and like thousands of years of history are mostly made up uh there are uh there's a reason of external control china is not a self-sufficient like sovereign power over its own decisions uh their their army is pure is made purely for internal use like people's enslavement army uh, uh there's plenty of cultural reasons for them not wanting to overtake the world like their self-centered nature uh culture their poor understanding of others their constant desire of copying western culture so it would be really hard for them to dictate their own agenda because, well, previously all they did was copy Western agenda, right? Um, uh, there's an economic reasons, uh, in particular, like their poor demography, their dependence on Western demand for their whatever they're producing, uh, their huge investment bubble they have that they have to pay for and only really western people can pay for it right etc etc so that's a huge dependence on the west anyways um then there are really really queer type of uh, arguments that you can produce like there are so, sort of like a i don't know how you call it like launch abort systems i mean that's a really stupid analogy but whatever uh, that you can bring up uh, to to fight the Chinese overtaking the world and those are like the existence of real China in Taiwan 
the existence of potential uh, like the poten potential for being sued for corona which would cost like a, an immensely huge amount of money to China right uh, even though again if the British are involved uh, China may take them with them you know so uh, it's it's a very sticky situation for a lot of people probably like half of the world might be involved eventually so maybe they, they desire to keep this can of worms closed because of that uh, who knows okay uh, I mean by half of the world would be involved I mean the elites obviously um, okay uh, yeah, so all these reasons basically show that China is not a world threat. More or less, this is what I wanted to say. Yeah, and, and like in general, to claim that such a new, such a young culture, such a young state may just jump, you know, in into the world and dominate it, like out of the blue, is just a ridiculous statement again. Uh, culture always wins and you cannot win like hundreds of years of culture with decades of copied culture right it's just impossible like yeah more or less I mean it sounds very kind of chauvinistic uh, maybe it is snobistic I don't know if it's the word but yeah I would say so. It's impossible. No, so you, you shouldn't be afraid of China. And if you are, well, you probably was brainwashed and it was probably made by uh, either British or American intellectuals, um, if you know what I mean. Okay, thank you for watching. The eons are closing.